was singing. That's worth coming to church for, wasn't it? Uh, marvelous folks who can sing that well and look forward to getting my glorified voice someday when I can sing like that. Al Smith said, anyone who can sing and won't sing ought to be sent to sing, sing, and say, well, they do sing. That's pretty good advice, I guess. Delighted to be with you this special season of the year. My favorite season of the year, by the way, when folks are singing about the Savior. Many do not understand what they're singing, but I enjoy hearing them sing. I heard a Christmas carol the other day, and I thought that needs correcting. Somewhere during the song, they said Jesus uh, turned into a man, or God turned into a man. I thought, no, they said that wrong. He didn't turn into a man. He didn't cease to be God and become a man. He became a man, not turned into a man, but they meant well. I read another story in a paper from California that said that Jesus Christ was probably 50% man and 50% God. I thought journalists should stick to journalism and not theology. He wasn't 50% man and 50% God. He's 100% man and 100% God. All God and all man, as much God as God himself, he was God. But as much man as any man here could feel and see and hear and suffer and, and uh, grieve and weep like you can grieve and weep. And what a wonderful thing that is. Because now we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. Therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That we obtain mercy and grace and find the help in time of need. What a savior. I'm so full of Christmas themes. I must have spoken at eight or ten different Christmas banquets. It seems that way at least. And I'm so full of Christmas stuff. I want to preach another Christmas message. But I, I resist the temptation and bring you a simple salvation sermon this morning. I promise not to hold you too long. I heard of a fellow who went to preach at a church. I've been there before. And uh, he saw the folks were getting a little restless. And thought they were about to walk out and leave him. So he thought he'd remedy the situation. He raised his voice and said, Now listen, people, it was Jesus Christ that brought me here, and it'll be Jesus that takes me out of here. And the choir stood and sung, What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Try to stop with the choir saying that. Can you hear me all right? I usually read a passage of Scripture and choose a text and then announce the subject and preach a sermon. This morning, I do not read the passage. I do not choose the text. I preach the sermon. Add to which I'll give you the text found in John chapter 3. Let me preface my remarks by saying this. As I preach on the subject, the only reason people go to hell. And uh, probably the most difficult or one of the most difficult teachings in the Christian faith is the doctrine of eternal damnation. It is hard for me to believe how anyone could do anything so bad in a lifetime. They'd be sent to a lake of fire, and there they'd stay forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never get out. But if we believe the Bible, we must believe in eternal damnation because the same word that describes the duration of God describes the duration of hell. In that centerpiece of all Christmas prophecies, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, he's called the everlasting Father. And the, and the fire in hell is called everlasting fire. So if, the, if God himself does not exist forever or everlasting, then the fire in hell is not everlasting. But on the other hand, if God is everlasting, then the fire in hell has to be everlasting because the same word is used to describe both. And still I tell you the doctrine of eternal damnation is a difficult doctrine for me to believe from a human standpoint. I can hardly believe that a little nine-year-old boy who knows he's lost, who in a service like this feels he should go forward and trust the Savior, but yet he refuses and dies in a car crash. That little fellow goes to hell in a lake of fire and he burns forever and ever and ever and ever, maybe a hundred years later. He looks out of hell up to heaven and says, Dear Jesus, I was only nine years old when I died. I've been in hell now for a hundred years. Surely this is enough. Surely I should get out now. But the Bible would answer back in John 3, 36, the latter part of the verse, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Abideth, yeah, stays. I cannot imagine abiding wrath. 
never leaving, but stays on you forever and ever and ever and ever. And the man in hell for a thousand years says it's time to get out. Surely it's time to get out. And the Bible answers back, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It stays on him forever and ever and ever. I have four children, nine grandchildren. And I look at them and I say, if they die without Christ, they go to hell. They may have lived a moral, pure life. They may have never done anything too bad, and yet they were sinners. But if they die, they go to hell. They stay there forever and ever and ever. That's a hard doctrine to swallow. And I'm going to tell you something. If I did not believe the Bible was the word of God, I would not believe in the doctrine of eternal damnation. But since I know the Bible is the word of God, I must believe it. I don't have to understand it, but I do believe it. Because Revelation 20 verse 10 says, And they shall be tormented day and, day and night forever and ever. I have a simple sermon. I want you to listen very carefully. I may shock you with some of my statements. Why do men go to hell? First of all, men do not go to hell because they're sinners. And that probably shocks you. Because the first thing you think, he's a sinner, he's going to hell. If he doesn't straighten his life out, he's going to hell. If men went to hell because they were sinners, everybody would go to hell. Because everybody is a sinner. Isn't that simple? Ecclesiastes 7.20 said, There's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now talk to me, how many are just? Not a one. And how many do not sin? Not a one. Romans 3.23 makes it very plain. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many? All. That means though I'm a preacher and have been preaching since I was a teenager, I'm still a sinner. It means though I try to live right, moral and pure and clean and keep my life straight, it means I still have sin because all have sin. It means your dear pastor has sinned, his wife is gracious, is anybody in the world has sinned, my wife has sinned, because all have sinned. You see, if men went to hell because they were sinners, everybody would go to hell except Jesus Christ because he's the only man that never sinned. And, and we sometimes measure sins in, in degrees, but God knows no such degree about sin. As a matter of fact, I never find an adjective before the word sin in the Bible. It just says sin. No descriptive word like bad sin or good sin or, or, or medium sin. Just sin. That's all. If men do not go to hell because they're sinners, I hear somebody saying, well, then it must be the kind of sins they commit. Our Catholic friends, who may have some here, categorize sins into venial and mortal sins. Venial sins are slight offenses. They're not real, real bad. Mortal sins are what the word implies. They're damning or killing sins. You can be a good Catholic 50 years and die with unconfessed mortal sin, so says the Catholic Church, and you go straight to hell. You don't get to go to purgatory or heaven. You go straight to hell. And there you stay forever and ever and ever because you died with an unconfessed, unforgiven mortal sin. On the other hand, you can die with venial sins and still go to heaven, but you can't go to heaven immediately. As a matter of fact, the Catholic teach that nobody's ready for heaven when they die because nobody lives perfect. Everybody has some unconfessed menial, venial sins hasn't been taken care of. So they invented a place called purgatory. It's a place where there's fire, but it's not hell. Because the fire in purgatory is not there to punish, it is there to purge or purify. That's why it's called purgatory. And so all Catholics go to purgatory when they die to be burned or purified or purged from all unconfessed venial sin. But nobody knows how long they stay there. So the Catholics pray sincerely for their dead. They have masses for them. A service designed to help them hurry and get out of the purgatory and not stay too long. As a matter of fact, Dr. Rice said after reading the biography of one Catholic pope that that particular pope had requested folks to pray for him that he wouldn't be in purgatory too long. So Catholics think you go to hell because of certain sins you commit, like a mortal sin as opposed to a venial sin. But I must shock and tell you, men do not go to hell because they're sinners. They do not go to hell because of the kind of sins they commit. Did you know something? The worst sinners in the Bible were saved. And some of the best people in the Bible were lost. If you'd have been living when Judas was alive, you'd probably want your little boy to grow up to be like Judas. He was one of the chosen 
12. As a matter of fact, so trusted that he was made the treasurer for the small group of 12. And you know the guy you make treasure is honest and you trust him. But he was a devil from the beginning. He was lost. But he lived like he was saved. He looked like he was saved. He talked like he was saved. He walked like he was saved. He was with Jesus when he performed the miracles, healing the sick, unstopping deaf ears, cleansing the leper, and raising the dead. On the other hand, Lot wasn't a good man at all. Committed incest with his two daughters. Both of them became pregnant, cursed the world with two races of people. Got drunk in a cave where there's no liquor store. He had to carry the liquor or wine out of Sodom with him in which to get drunk. If you looked at his life in the Old Testament, you'd say he wasn't saved. But you'd be wrong because the New Testament says that just man vexed his righteous soul daily with the filthy conversation of the wicked. I think some of the worst sinners in the Bible were those who crucified the Savior. I can't imagine anybody being more mean than those men. They were the ones that stripped him naked before his followers humiliated him. Beat him with a scourge until his back looked like you'd taken a pocket knife and cut around it 195 times. Josephus, an early historian who was not a Christian, wrote about those scourgings. And he said the scourging victim often stood in a pool of blood with his inner organs lying at his feet and few victims ever survived the scourging. They put Jesus through that. And then they patted a crown of thorns and pressed it into his brow. Have you seen those thorns in Israel about that long? cruel looking thing it makes your whole body have cold chills even prick your finger with one and they press it into his brow and blood came down his face they actually plucked his beard out can you see this can you visualize this uh, taking a little at a time and plucking it you couldn't pluck a complete beard out you'd have to take it a little at a time and a little at a time till all the beard was gone and his face was a was a bloody mess he hung on the cross till every bone was out of joint, so says the psalmist. Every bone. Not one bone, not, a, not an ankle out of joint, but every bone in his body out of joint. You wouldn't even recognize him if you had seen him as a human being, hardly. There he hung. The they wasn't done with him. They spit in his face after plucking his beard out, and then they blindfolded him and smote him with a reed and said, Prophesy, who, who smote you? If you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. He could have told them very easily, but he didn't. That must have been the meanest crowd in the Bible. Yet, when Jesus was hung on the cross, the first thing he uttered was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And a few days later, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached to that mob of unsaved people, at least 3,000 unsaved because 3,000 got saved, Peter said to that crowd, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, you did crucify the Lord of glory. You know something? Some of those in that crowd were the very ones that drove the nails in his hands. Some of those in that very crowd were the ones that plucked the beard from his face, and yet some of them were saved. You see, men do not go to hell because they're sinners. They do not go to hell because of the kind of sins they commit. Now listen to me. Is it coming on? Forget it. Number three, men do not go to hell because they won't live right. My old son who teach you said to me, now, you boys and girls, you better straighten your life up and live right and obey your mom and dad. If you don't do right, you go to hell. She meant well, but she gave bad instructions. You don't get better to get saved. You get saved to get better. You can't get better till you do get saved. A fellow said to Bob Jones Sr. one time, Bob, as soon as I get on my feet, I'm going to become a Christian. And Bob Wise, they said, you don't become a Christian by getting on your feet. You become a Christian by getting on your face. Let me show you something. Did you know getting saved is kind of like getting married? Not exactly, but kind of. One leads to heaven, of course. But Jesus used a marriage illustration in the Bible to illustrate his relationship to us. In Ephesians 5, he said the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He said the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He said the wife is to be submissive to her own husband as the church is submissive to Christ. He uses that relationship to illustrate his relationship to us. Now hold it. Watch this. Did you know you can live like you're married without being married? It's happening more and more as days go by. 
I was shocked when I was pastor of Forest Hills Baptist Church a long, long time ago to discover a man and a woman in my church that had five children that had been married. I discovered it because I went to see him and tried to win him to Christ on his job at a furniture store. And he began to cry and said, I can't be saved. And I said, why not? He said, I'm going to tell you something which you can't tell nobody. I said, what? He said, I'm not married. I cannot be saved. I said, well, you should be married, but you can be saved. And I turned to John chapter 4 and read the story of the woman at the well who had been married five times and was living with a man that was not her husband. And Jesus didn't say you can't be saved because you've had too many husbands. He said, if you ask me, I'll give you a drink of living water. When I read that story, he began to cry. And in the back of that furniture store, he trusted Christ as his Savior and wept. He was so happy. I baptized him. And later won his wife to Christ, was his wife then, and baptized her. Did you know they wanted to get married, and I married them? Their children never knew it. My church never knew it. I never told about it. I used to go by and have coffee with them. Some, some, I better tell too much about them. Some Sunday mornings. You know, you can live like you're married without being married. A boy and girl move in together. Men won't move in together. They live together five years, ten years, fifteen years. Have children. Five or six children. They're nice to each other. Speak to each other. They act like they're married. But you can't act like you're married long enough to be married. On the other hand, I know some folks who have been married 30, 40 years that act like they're not married. They never speak to each other. They hate each other. They fuss all the time. They holler at each other. They try to see which one can hurt the other the most. You been around about like that? He used to be nice to her. He'd open the door and let her in the car and close the door back gently. Now he opens the door and slams it on her leg and drags her out the driveway. If you're around him, you go in their home you, and the air is so thick you can feel the anger and hatred in the air. You can feel it. Almost you can cut it. To the no love there at all. They act like they're not married, but they are married. The point I'm making is you can't live like you're married long enough to be married. And you can't live like you're unmarried long enough to be unmarried. You still with me? By the way, when I do this, I'm trying to get you to say amen. This is not a nervous habit I have. I should tell you that. If you don't know, you'll wonder what's wrong with me doing this. And I'm only hearing an amen the reason I do that. Men do not go to hell because they're sinners. Are you listening? You don't go to hell because of the kinds of sins you commit. Number three, you don't go to hell because you won't live right. You ought to live right, but you can live like a Christian all your life and not be saved. Proof, Matthew 7, 20. They stand at the judgment and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Hadn't we cast out devils in your name? Hadn't we done many mighty wonderful works in your name? Then he will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because they were trusting their good life to get them to heaven. They were not trusting Christ. I'm going to shock you again. Don't jump till you listen. Men do not go to hell because they won't quit their sinning. Does that blow your mind? Because you've heard all your life. Now, if you want to get saved, you've got to turn from all your sin. You've got to quit your sinning. And just to prove my point, I'm going to ask you a question. How many here have quit your sin? You had not sinned since you've been saved. Raise your hand. I want to get your picture and put it in the sword of the Lord. Who hasn't sinned since you've been saved? I'm watching my wife close. She's got both hands tied up under a blanket over here. How many think you may have sinned at least once since you've been saved? Raise a hand. Let me see it. Come on, Randy. Get your hand up. I'm looking at you. How many think you may have sinned once since you've been saved? Get your hand up. Don't lie. God, look at you lying right now. All of you lying. How many think you may have sinned at least twice since you've been saved? Raise your hand. Randy, you can raise both feet. I know. Sure. Now, I wish I didn't sin. Honest, I wish I never sinned. As a matter of fact, the night I got saved, I was only 11 years old. I was at home on my bed. I felt so good. You don't go by feelings, but I did have some good feelings. I slept with my older brother. I wanted to hug and kiss him. I knew I had been saved or lost my mind. I didn't know which. I patted him on the shoulder. I was afraid I'd wake him up. He'd kill me. But I rubbed his shoulder. I said, Bobby, I love you. But I whispered. Don't want to hear me. He'd wake up and hit me. But I, I felt so good. I felt so happy. I even said to Jesus that night, Jesus, 
I'll never sin again. In just a few minutes, I began to feel like I should go and tell my mother and daddy what had happened. As a matter of fact, something inside, I should say someone, said go tell mom and daddy, they want to know this. And before I got off the bed to tell them something else that I wouldn't tell them, I'd wait in the morning. They can wait, they're asleep, don't wake them up. But this other something said, no, it's important enough to tell them. But this other something said, don't do it. And that went on in my body, that little argument. And I listened to the wrong voice and didn't tell mom and daddy. I went back to bed, went to sleep. After having just said, I'll never sin again, I sinned immediately by not obeying the Holy Spirit's prompting. It was a year later before I told them about it when I joined the church to get baptized in August. I kept it from them all that time. But I was saved. But I was disobeyed. I wish I never sinned. Thought said to me, by the way, he was a, he, this, guy, this man was a president of a university, as far as I'm going to go with this. But he wrote me a letter and said to me, Dr. Hudson, I know that I quit my sinning. And I wrote back and said, congratulations, you're the only guy that ever did. Even Jesus didn't quit his sinning. He didn't have any to quit. So you have a unique position in the world. You're the only man out of all the beings that ever lived who quit your sinning, and I congratulate you. He wrote back and said, I don't mean I don't sin. Of course I still sin. And I said, I wrote back and said, I'm as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. In one letter you said you quit your sinning. In the next letter you said you still sin. Now how do you still sin if you quit your sinning? He wrote and said, I didn't quit all of them, of course. I quit some of them. College president, university president. I wrote back and said, okay, tell me which ones you had to quit in order to get saved. I'd like to make a list of them. He never answered again. Because the Bible doesn't tell you which one you got to quit. Now, you ought to live right. I'm not condoning living wrong. I'm not condoning sin. But if a man had to quit his sinning to get saved, nobody would ever get saved because nobody ever quits their sinning. Nobody. There are no perfect people. Sam Jones, who used to preach in the Ramon Order. That Ramon Order was built for Sam Jones. Revivals are built by, by the riverboat captain up here, Captain Ramon. Because Sam Jones had meetings out in the open, and he built him at nice auditorium. They thought they built for the Grand Ole Opry. It wasn't. It was built for Sam Jones, old meetings in. But he asked over there one time, Is anybody here know a perfect person? And one lady even raised her hand. He said, Lady, you know a perfect person? Well, she said, I never met her, but my husband talks about her all the time. She's his first wife. Now, there are no perfect people. First, second, third wives. None of them are perfect. No, you, now listen, you don't go to hell because you're a sinner. You don't go to hell because of the kinds of sins you commit. You don't go to hell because you won't live right. You don't go to hell because you won't quit your sinning. Now, listen carefully. You go there for one reason. You got a Bible in John chapter 3. Look at it quickly. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Look at it. You know what condemn means? The condemned criminal is the sentence criminal. It's the fellow who's been arrested, tried, found guilty, and sentenced. Let's say it's a capital offense, and he's sentenced to be executed in the electric chair, let's say February the 1st. He's put in death row waiting for February the 1st. He's called a condemned criminal. Why? He's already sentenced. Are you getting the picture? Now, the Bible said, he that believeth on him is not condemned. When we believe in Christ, the sentence is lifted. Wouldn't it be a great thing if a guy with a death penalty could have the judge said, not condemned, sentence lifted? Wouldn't it be a great thing? God said, we believe on the Son. We're not condemned. We're no longer under the sentence. What's the sentence? The sentence is the second death, the lake of fire, hell. When we believe on the Son, we're not condemned. But watch the rest of the verse now. And I want you to read it like it is. Don't add anything to it. And he that believeth not is condemned. Already. Already. Not going to be someday in the future. He that believeth not is condemned already because he's a sinner. Is that what it says? No. Well, let's change it then. Let's get it right. He that believeth not is condemned already because he won't live right. Is that what it says? Well, let's get it right then. Let's try it again. He that believeth not is condemned already because of the kind of sins he commits. Is that what it says? Well, let's get it right then. 
We get it right this time for sure. He that believeth not is condemned already because he won't quit his sin. What it says? Well, why don't we read it like it says it? He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Isn't that simple stuff? So men go to hell for one reason. Won't believe. Look at verse 36, same chapter. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Somebody help me. If I had everlasting life, how long would it last? Forever. Isn't that simple? You got to go to an Armenian school to find out everlasting does not mean everlasting. But if you just go to a regular school, you know it lasts forever. I'm working this here overtime up here now. He that believes on the Son has at that moment everlasting life. Now watch the rest of the verse. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Isn't that simple? Jesus, talking to Nicodemus, says men go to hell for one reason, because they won't believe on the Son. Now listen very carefully. I'm going to wrap this up. A younger preacher than myself. I started to say a young preacher, but I'm a young preacher. I'm in the neighborhood of 30. It's a big neighborhood, but I'm in the neighborhood. I'm around 30, but I've been around twice. Watch it. A younger preacher came to me and said, Well, Dr. Hudson, if what you say is true, everybody is saved. I said, Well, let's stop before we go any further. Don't say if what I say is true. Say if what the Bible says is true. Because I didn't say that. The Bible said that. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. They said, Okay, if what the Bible says is true, everybody is saved. I said, go ahead with the argument. He said, because everybody I meet says they believe on Christ. I haven't met anybody that doesn't. He waited for my response. I said, okay, you're through? He said, I'm through. I said, okay. The problem is we use the word believe in various ways. I tell you, I believe it's going to be partly cloudy tomorrow or partly sunny, either way you want it, with a high of 53 degrees. That's a calculated hope based on the best information I have from unreliable weathermen. I believe it's going to be in the mid-40s on Tuesday and back up in the low 50s again on Wednesday. That's a calculated hope based on the best information I have. That's not what it means to believe in Christ. I tell you that I believe that this is a microphone that's given mental assent to a fact I've got one in my hand. This is one I know, Mike. I want to see one. That's not what it means to believe in Christ. It may include that, but it means more than that. I tell you that I believe that this chair will support my weight. That's expressing confidence in its ability. That's not what it means to believe in Christ. It may include that, but it means more. You still with me? To believe in Christ does not mean a calculated hope or giving mental assent to a fact or expressing confidence in his ability. You may say, oh, I believe Christ was born 2,000 years ago, the birth we worship or celebrate this Christmas. I believe he died on a cross like we sometimes sing about in our church. You can say all that and not be saved. You're expressing mental assent to a fact. That's not what it means to believe in Christ. To believe in Christ, now watch me, I'm going to demonstrate it. It means to trust him. It means to rely on him. It means to depend on him. Now, I'm going to do several things, and you watch what I do. I believe this is a chair. That's mental ascent to a fact, but it has not solved my problems. I'm still standing, and my legs are getting tired. Watch this. I believe that chair will hold me up. It'll support my weight. That's expressing confidence in its ability, but I haven't solved my problem. I'm still standing. My legs are still hurting. Don't you see that? I answered all the questions. You can say, I believe Jesus was a real man. Sure. I believe he was God's son. Sure. God in human flesh. Sure. I believe he died on a cross. Sure, sure. You answered all the questions right, but you hadn't solved your problem yet. I must only believe it is a chair, mental ascent to a fact. I must only believe it will hold me up or support my weight, confidence, sensibility. Now, I must make a decision to trust it. So I go a step further than giving mental assent to a fact and expressing confidence and ability. I sat down on the chair, take both feet off the floor, put all my 200, that's far enough, 200 pounds on it. 
If the chair falls, somebody tell me what happens to me. Say it out loud. I fall because I'm trusting nothing but the chair. My hope is built on nothing less than in the chair in which I rest. Did you come to pass the chair should fall down will come Humpty Hudson and all? I'm trusting nothing but the chair. Now watch it. Suppose that I put 90% of my weight on the chair and reach over and hold with the back of this chair with 10%. The 10% destroys the 90%. Because the 10% says I'm not fully trusting the chair. Now you write this down in your Bible when I'm dead and gone tell them I said this. There is no promise anywhere in the Bible to those who partially believe on Christ. The promise is to those who believe on Christ. It is not Jesus 90% and the baptistry 10%. It is not Jesus Christ 99% and the baptistry 1%. It is not Jesus Christ 90% and my, ba- and my Baptist church 10%. It is not Jesus 90% and my good works 10%. It's Jesus Christ 100% or it's not Jesus Christ at all. I'll tell you this story and I'm through. No, I'm not through. I'm stopping. I never get through. Monroe Parker, a great evangelist, nicknamed Monk, now in his 80s, had a revival in Alabama. He saw a boy selling watermelons. At that time, there were 60 cents. He said, son, how much of those melons is 60 cents? And Monroe Parker reached in his pocket, pulled out a half a dollar, and said, I don't have 60 cents. All I have is a half a dollar. And the man said, well, give me the half a dollar, and I'll, I'll trust you for a dime. That's an old Georgia expression. And Monroe Parker put the half a dollar back in his pocket and picked the watermelon up and started walking away. And the boy said, wait a minute, mister, wait, wait a minute. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm, I'm going home, I'm going to my room. Well, he said, give him my half a dollar. Well, he said, you said you'd trust me. The boy said, no, I said I'd trust you for a dime. Monroe Parker said, if you trust me, you trust me. And started walking away. He said, wait a minute, mister. He said, either give me that half a dollar or put my watermelon down. Monroe said, you said you'd trust me. He said, I said I'd trust you for a dime. Now, if you're not going to give him my half dollar, put the watermelon down. And Monk Parker laid the watermelon down and said to the boy, you don't trust me at all. You're just willing to take a 10-cent chance on me. And walked away. Now, the guy that's trusting Jesus Christ plus something else doesn't trust Jesus at all. I don't care what the plus is. Don't care if it's your good life, reformation, okay, what? If you're trusting Jesus Christ plus something else, you're saying Jesus Christ is not sufficient, he's not enough, and I've got to add to him my good works or my baptism or something else. Now, I'm forgetting baptized as an act of obedience, but not as an instrument of salvation. Don't you see that? Why do men go to hell? Not because they're sinners. Not because of the kind of sins they commit. Not because they don't live right. Not because they won't quit their sinning because nobody does. But because they will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing what I know right now. And not knowing how long I'll live, by the way. If I had to make my decision how to be saved, it would go something like this. Jesus, my only hope of heaven is you. If you didn't die and pay my sin debt, I can't go to heaven. I'm trusting you and you alone and nothing else for salvation. In my hand, no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I'm wholly, completely leaning on Jesus' name. If I had to die right now and stand in heaven, why should we let you in, Curtis? I say one reason. Jesus died to pay my sin debt. And I'm trusting him and him alone and nothing else. And the angel would have an old-fashioned Nazarene Pentecostal Baptist slobber and running fit and say, come in, boy, come in. You got the answer to this place. Get in here. The sad thing is there'll be more people in hell because of a wrong message than there will 
be for a lack of a message. Many shall come to me in that day. How many? Many. And say, Lord, hadn't we prophesied? What were they doing? They're trusting what somebody told them they had to do to get saved rather than trusting Jesus Christ. Now, I preach you a simple salvation sermon. If you're saved, you should be like myself, and I think you would be. You'd rejoice to hear it. If you're not saved, you have no excuse to leave this building. You can never say to God, I didn't really know how because nobody told me how. You were told very plainly this morning. 